The Blue Island by W. T. Stead Read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful B.C. Chapter 8 Reality of Thought Communication in trying to establish a definite form of communication between the Earth sphere and the Blue Island, people are always looking for the return of the physical part of the individual. They find it exceedingly difficult to accept even the most pressing mental tests as being proof of communication. And in giving so much attention to this physical form, they nearly overlook the form of thought communication, which is much more personal and very much less tainted by outside influence, such as the medium's mind or other sitters, antagonism or bias either way. This thought communication is a much more real form than is accepted by the majority of believers in the possibility of it. In concentrating the mind on any one spirit person, you are sending out real, live, active forces. These forces pass through the air in precisely the same way as electric waves do, and they never miss their mark. You concentrate on Mr. A in the spirit world, and immediately Mr. A is conscious of a force coming to him. In this land, we are much more sensitive than while on earth, and when thoughts are directed to us by people on your side, we have a direct call from those currents of thought thus generated, and we are practically always able to come in close contact with the person who is thinking of us. When near and acclimatized to his conditions, we can impress thoughts and ideas upon his mind. He will seldom accept them for what they are, but will think they are his own normal thoughts or something of a hallucination. Nevertheless, if frequent opportunity is given, he will be startled at the amount of information he can record. This applies to everyone, not merely to the believer in these subjects. Anyone who sits for a moment and allows his mind to dwell on some dear one who had died will actually draw the spirit of that person to himself. He may be conscious or unconscious of the presence, but the presence is there. If people on earth realize the results of their thoughts upon those to whom they refer, they would be very much more careful in giving their mind free play. There are so many thoughts possible, and all of them are registered here. Many of them affect the people they concern, but all of them affect the people from whom they emanate. Perhaps in telling you all thoughts are recorded, I'm making it more difficult for you to accept and understand. It will be better, therefore, to explain that by all thoughts, I refer only to all direct thoughts. In reality, every thought is registered. The personal ones are, as I have previously said, of no importance so long as they are not allowed to grow into destructive thoughts. In speaking of direct thought, I mean you to understand positive thoughts about other people pleasant or unpleasant, and not the thoughts of everyday trivialities. Many people find it impossible to believe that every direct thought they have is registered, or that it can in any way 
influence or affect the person concerned or return to influence themselves, but this is so. You are fully aware of the influence given out by any one person who is deeply depressed or more than usually excited and happy. Each of you has felt this influence. This is, of course, caused by the lower or raised mental vibrations, giving out particularly strong currents of either depression or happiness. They are equally strong currents in themselves, although they act differently upon the people with whom they come into contact. It is in this way that all direct thoughts act. Frequently, the subject is not conscious of these thoughts upon himself, but influence is there in a subtle and greater or lesser degree of strength. And all these thoughts are very definitely registered in the mind of the thinker long after the incident itself has passed. When coming to this land, that whole record has to be dealt with, not by a judge in a wig and gown, but by our own spirit selves. In spirit life we have a full and clear remembrance of all these things, and, according to the quality of these individual thoughts, so we are brought into a state of regret, happiness or unhappiness, despair or satisfaction. It is here that we meet with the desire to make return, to put right all the discomfort and distress, minor or major as it may be, caused by thoughtless mind action while on earth. This is why I say that while on earth it is not only advisable but essential to keep your minds under control and in order. It is only wisdom so to do. The difficulty is that people will not realize this while on earth although they know from their own inner consciousness that I'm stating a truth. I want you all to try to realize the results you are making, the unhappiness you are causing others, and the regret and sorrow you are laying up for yourselves in the next world when you have to face the conditions you have made. Remember that your minds are the generating houses. You are building up whatever is to be your next condition, precisely and exactly by the lives you are leading on earth, by your thoughts, by the degree to which your body controls your mind instead of your mind ruling supreme. So long as you are upon earth, you are body or physical and soul or mind and spirit or self. When you come here, you are mind or soul and self, spirit only. Therefore, for your own future happiness, it is essential that your mind should rule during earth life. It is for you to say whether it shall do so. If you are willing to pay your bill when you come over, carry on as you are. But there is no further credit given. You have to settle it here. If you are a quarter as practical as you each and all think you are, you will see to it that the mind leads. It can lead very delightfully, although you may think it leads only to religious restriction. It does not only lead there. It leads to all earth's pleasures, all earth's enjoyments, 
but it always holds the ruling hand and can stop at the right time, whereas the body cannot. And so it runs up debts which have to be paid, and paid sometimes very dearly and bitterly. Earth was made beautiful for man to enjoy, not merely to tantalize him, lead him on, and then say no. That is not the way of our blessed Creator. He has given beauty and the faculty for enjoying beauty to all mankind, and so long as the mind rules, it will continue to be beauty. But when only the body rules, influencing and degrading the mind as it will, then trouble lies ahead, much trouble, and much acute regret. When we are here, our minds work in the same manner, they obey the same rules, and the presence or absence of body does not hinder our thinking powers. And Consequently, there is no difficulty in coming into touch with some of our people left behind, and being in close touch with them, influencing them greatly, although many of them are unconscious of it. I want you to think of this, and to realize that your own people can come to you, that thought is all-powerful, and that you can build up or destroy, help or hinder, draw near you or drive away from you, the people incarnate and discarnate, who were and who are so dear to each of you by this power of thought. Thought communication is the closest link between the two worlds, but it must be well-ordered and well-trained brain action. You must not imagine that every idea which enters your mind is put there by a spirit person. It is not so at all, but at the same time, if you train your mind in the way an athlete trains his body, you can then ask for and receive great knowledge and much help, both spiritual and material. Chapter 9 Important Points A subject of this importance and interest is full of queries. Each one has his own questions to put, and each brings what he considers a hitherto unnoticed point. I want, if possible, to answer a few of these constantly recurring queries now. I had many put to me during my investigations while on earth, and some of them I can answer at last. I want you first to realize that by this change called death, you do not become part of the Godhead immediately. The mysteries of life are not revealed to you as a kind of welcoming gift on your arrival here. You must not think that I or any have full knowledge on all subjects, profound and trivial, the moment we come to spirit life. I cannot tell you when your grandson will next require new shoes nor can I tell you the settlement of the Irish question. I can only see a little farther than you, and I do not by any means possess the key to the door of all knowledge and all truth. That we have each to work for, and as we pass through one door, we find another in front of us to be unlocked, and another, and another. But, on the other hand, remember that I do know more, considerably more, than you do, because I am in more intimate touch with the main source of knowledge, and I have passed through an experience which is still ahead of you all. 
I should like first to speak about the word conditions and its true meaning. It is a word which is grossly misapplied in all forms of psychic work. It is given as a reason for this or that failure, for a success, for any peculiarity in result, and is looked upon as necessary in any apartment in which a meeting is to be held, rightly and wrongly, but usually wrongly. The main factor, or essential, in obtaining good results lies in the condition of the sitter's mind more than the room he is in. The mental attitude and the physical state of the sitter is of very much more importance than of the presence of draped windows or thick carpets, exotic perfumes, etc., etc. It is the method of mental approach which matters most. That is a feature often overlooked by even first-grade sensitives. Certain extras, if rightly used and properly directed, round the apartment, such as a cheerful face, pleasant flowers, laughter, brightness, these are all quite useful assets, but they are not the essentials. Some people always try to reduce to ridicule communication with the next world, one of the greatest of God's blessings to mankind, and complain of what they consider to be the senseless conditions ruling at a seance. Many of these conditions, as I've said, are meaningless and sometimes a hindrance, but at the same time, others are necessary according to the kind of communication sought after. To make my point, I must recall to you how conditions govern everything, and so much does everything depend upon given suitable conditions that people do not even notice that this is so. The simplest and perhaps the most useful example of this is in making a pot of tea. You must have the tea in a certain condition. You must have the water in a certain condition. If you do not, you get poor results. Your flowers. You have your seeds in a certain condition of dryness, and you put them to earth when the climate is in a certain condition according to the time of year, and once planted, you tend your plants, your flowers, trees, everything, according to the condition that they demand. We demand conditions. Why should you think that this great scientific work can be governed, mastered, by inexperienced hands at any take-it-or-leave-it moment? You cannot reasonably expect it, and if you do, you won't get it. Conditions govern earth and all forms of life on it, from an earlier state than that when consciousness begins. But I tell you, many of the conditions demanded by intelligent workers in this subject are futile and, worse, harmful. You cannot achieve success in anything or along any line by directing your force in opposition to your intelligence. A vast number do in this subject, and that is why there is so much failure. You may as well try to take a photograph without putting any film into the camera, and because you get no result, you say the whole thing is impossible and fraudulent. You must have conditions in order to secure success in any and everything. It is due to lack of these necessary conditions that we fail sometimes to influence a person to do or not to do a certain act. A father in spirit life 
may be fully conscious of a son contemplating a certain deed, say, suicide or murder, or anything of that kind. Such knowledge will cause great sorrow to the father, and he will work his utmost to influence the son, to direct his thoughts, and destroy the idea of whatever is contemplated. But at such time, the son is in an abnormal state of excitement, which nearly always prevents our influence from getting to him and working upon him. It is not at all a state of happiness for the father, because he's fully aware of his son's acts, and he's powerless to prevent him. In action we are free, absolutely free. We have graduated in the blue school. We are free to go amongst the other spheres, the lands where many or several or none of our own people are. We can go to them, and we can take help from those more developed and give help to those less fortunate. Help by advice, help by demonstration, help by association. We are still living on the Blue Island. Not yet do we pass to the next sphere for domicile. As we are able to travel among these other lands, so we are able to be in constant touch with Earth. Thoughts of us sent out by people on Earth reach us, and we sense from whom they come, and can follow up the person if so desired. We would not get every thought form from anyone who happened to see our names and make a casual remark, but anyone with whom we were intimate while on earth, a thought of us will come straight, as along a telephone wire from one house to another, and if we wish, we can come. In this way, we are able to help people left behind. We can follow their actions and their minds, and influence them one way or another, according to our idea of what is for their good. But we cannot do impossible things even for those dearest to us. While on earth, one can give advice, but one cannot force it into practice. So, here, we can influence but not create. Having attained this state, there is no parting. There is no sting to death. We can be with our own beyond us, with us, below us, and with those still on earth. Separation and partings are not known, except by the law of attraction and affection. We leave people behind on the earth who dutifully mourn for us, who are genuinely upset at their loss, but after a while, short or long, their remembrance of us grows thin. They cease to think of us, to recall us, and to remember our companionship. They are the only partings. In some cases, even those people come back to our lives when they themselves come to this land. Gradually, as they throw off the influences which dimmed their remembrance of us, they find the foundation of that old affection. Sometimes it is untouched, sometimes spoiled, but these are the only partings. A spirit who comes here and is anxious to get in touch with earth ties may be made more unhappy by being with the earth people, for if they do not understand that he is still alive, they are all sadness, and they think of him as dead, as something finished. 
although the spirit will go to them a great deal at first, the earth people will not know he is there, and seeing them, but being unable to make his presence known, causes him much disappointment and sorrow, and they are ignorant of his presence, and think only of him as dead. He will finally stay away altogether, content to wait until they join him. This accounts for many people who are not apparently making any attempt to communicate, and for earth people to say that this cannot be true because their dearest so-and-so never made any sign to them. When you are over in this life, you will not be continually associated with people who are not of interest to you. On earth you eliminate, as far as practicable, the people who tire and try you. But here that can be done effectively because those feelings and instincts are entirely mutual. The governing force is love. Affections bind people together, and if the love between any two or any group is a strong and real thing, then those people are in close unison and happiness together. But wherever the love is not on both or all sides, there is automatically a falling away of the affected party. Nothing uneven or unequal holds. When you come through death, you are attracted by the ties of love into the set of people who vibrate the same affection. And if you have had an affection for another which is not equally shared, although you will at first be together, you will gradually and yet quietly cease to attract each other and cease to be in each other's company. Chapter 10 The State of Freedom Everything is ordered. I have touched lightly upon my first arrival and my impressions of the new surroundings and of my first return to earth and the manner of it. Without giving technical and scientific formula at all, I think I have given you a fair picture and a rough idea of the next step after earth life. What I have said applies to all the human race. Whites, blacks, yellows, there is no differentiation. One rule holds for all races of mankind. I shall pass for the present, to a further stage. I may return to say more about the Blue Island, but now I will leave all life there to continue on its way, and will deal with a further point of development, the state of being rid of most earth instincts. Once rid of these, we are able to pass with comparative ease and almost at will from one sphere to another, and from this or that other sphere back to earth, keeping thereby in close association with our own people or those of them who desire it. We help by influencing them in their daily lives and actions, and we do this without in any way retarding our own work, development and construction of character. Character is the main thing to be studied. While on the Blue Island, I studied, as all do, the secrets of self and of life, and I came to realize the vastness of creation. It is not life on earth and then life on this island only. 
as progress is made and Earth's inclinations and habits are put aside, so other interests take their place, and then comes the desire for true knowledge. As others do and will do, so did I. I fell into line also, and as I learned, so I progressed. Capacity for wisdom grew with the wisdom acquired. I had learnt of the existence of other lands besides this island, and at one time it seemed as incredible as the possible existence of this land does to many now on earth, but eventually the time came when I was taken to these other spheres. I cannot tell where they are, but it was like traveling amongst the stars. It seems as if we left our world and traveled through space until we reached another star, another land. There are several of these other lands, and they are inhabited by former Earth people, who have progressed sufficiently to qualify for entry into this or that land. These other lands are nearly all inhabited by a higher form of life, a happier form and, individually, a more powerful form. But there are one or two other lands of not so high an order, where happiness is less or not at all, according to whether life on earth was a well or lightly ordered thing. In these lands, the people who are there fail and fail again to find the spirit in themselves to desire to rise to improve and control themselves, although the necessary strength is offered, and offered, and even thrust at them. All races have the gift of free will. All are free agents in determining their own destinies. At all times, not only after the body's death, just as a father and a mother of a family order the day's routine for their children, and allow the children, then, to amuse themselves in their own way, so the races of mankind are free to develop and model their lives upon their own individual pattern, being given certain rules to conform to. All life is originally free, but, whilst on earth, through poor comprehension and mismanagement, the individual often thinks he's not a free personage with free will, but he is. As the same father and mother will influence and guide their children, the cause being love, so when we are here, and find ourselves able, we do our utmost to help and influence those we love who are still on earth. Always it is the driving force of love which causes us to do our work. We can be in close touch with our people on earth, and by suggestion and by close association, we can influence them. Through our influence, often much material good will come to them. We, spirit people, cannot give material riches to anyone on earth, but we can frequently advise as to the best step to take in a business matter which, if taken, will bring in considerable material wealth. Just as we can influence in a spiritual sense, so can we influence in a business way. We people over here can see both sides of the argument. When a thing is to be decided between two people, we can see both points, and can therefore see which is right. And if we play straight, 
we throw our influence in with that, whether it's to the benefit of our earth friend, in a material sense, or not. If we do this, and our earth friend loses or suffers from it, we invariably make it up later, in a different way. If we throw our influence against our own conviction, only in order to help our earth friend, we pay for it here, ourselves, and our earth friend, who thereby gains unjustifiably, pays for it later, either while on earth or when in spirit life. He will have to make return, sooner or later. There is no escape. It's automatic. In saying we can and do influence people on earth, I do not propose to go into the precise process of how we work. It's near enough to say that you know how you influence each other on earth. Here the result is the same, although the process is quite different. But that is a matter which each one of you will deal with individually later on, when your own change comes. Therefore it's not of necessity nor of interest to you to know now. You have, on earth, a saying that, coming events cast their shadows before. This is a truth. They do cast their influences, and sensitive people can always register them, and can often make a guess at their origin. Chapter 11 Premonitions there are many superstitions and many reasons given to explain what is called premonition, but in almost every instance it can be traced to telepathy. There are so many forms of mental sympathy. The chief form of premonition is that concerning the death of another, a friend or a relation. Now, always that can be traced to telepathy. You will argue that perhaps the person about to pass on was not anticipating his death. It may have been through a sudden accident, and yet so-and-so had a certain sign, a premonition, so many days or such and such a time beforehand. To explain this, Mr. A has a premonition about the death of Mr. B. It is followed up later by an accident in which Mr. B is killed. The spirit friends who are interested in Mr. B have been in continual attendance upon him, and are watching him in order to be of use whenever possible, but they cannot make him do this or that with any certainty. They can only influence him one way or another. Now, all the actions of Mr. B's life are producing certain effects, some of which Mr. B himself is not at once conscious of. His spirit friends are and they can see a certain distance ahead what the results of these actions, the general routine of his life, may be. In this way, they can see ahead what is going to occur to Mr. B, and although they will do their utmost to guide him, they cannot act for him. He sets his own destiny in motion, and he alone can alter it. At such a time, the spirit friends, realizing that Mr. B is in physical danger, will do their utmost to divert his actions and movements. Sometimes they are successful, but in this particular instance they are not, and Mr. B meets his death. 
the influences being used by the spirit people have created a disturbance of thought force around him, and although he was not conscious of it himself, his friend, Mr. A, has registered it upon his mind, and it has reproduced itself in sleep as a dream or as a vision built up by thought power and materialized through and from the physical strength of Mr. B. Distance between Mr. A and B makes no difference. Premonitions concerning an arrangement made which is afterwards not fulfilled are caused by the influence of spirit friends trying always to guide their charges to the benefit of themselves. In this way, you can figure out the cause of all so-called premonitions. In every case, it is spirit friends trying to communicate with the person chiefly concerned. He often fails to register what another will pick up. End of chapter 11